Hello there and welcome to a new episode of the Irish Genealogy Podcast, where I talk to you about all things Irish genealogy, mother and baby homes, and more. From births, to baptisms, to dog licenses, and no, I'm not kidding about the last one. Share, subscribe, and enjoy. Let's get into today's episode. Along the South Wing Road in Cork City, you will find Matten Point, which is a shopping district for the people of Cork City. But it wasn't always like that. Matten Point had formerly been on the grounds of the Bedsborough Estate, what formerly was a 200-acre plot of land owned by the Pike family, who were a family of Quakers. Prior to 1921, unmarried mothers and their children would have been admitted to workhouses. And as we know, workhouses were a sort of last resort for people who, either as an act of desperation or could not support themselves or who maybe were ill or for whatever reason it may have been. There were concerns raised about the well-being of mothers and children, particularly unmarried mothers and children, who were either being admitted or born into them, and didn't feel that with all the illness and disease that may have been in the workhouses, that it was the most suitable place for them. So already before the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed in December of 1921, there were already desires to try and fill a void of some kind for unmarried mothers to give birth to their children in more suitable institutions. The chairman of the Cork Union Board of Guardians, Seamus Langford, was interested in the issues surrounding unmarried mothers and was surprised by the lack of facilities that were available to them. And after a bit of time and examining how several religious orders took care of people under their wing, he decided that the Sisters of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary were the best suited for the work that he had in mind. In autumn of 1921, the Pike family, who were living at the Besborough Estate, were selling it and with financial help from the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster and the encouragement of Dr. Cohelan, the Bishop of Cork, this was purchased for the sum of £800, which around nowadays would be about £49,700. This institution had admitted over 9,000 mothers through its doors. And despite what Seamus Langford imagined would probably be a boon to the local community and a satisfactory place for women and children who were be admitted or born into it, it became fairly clear that this was not a great place for children to be brought up in or born into. Over the course of 76 years, 923 children had died in Besbra. The worst year was 1943, with 100 deaths, but on average, it ranged between 10 to a little over 40 deaths. If you looked at the final report of the Commission of Investigation into Mother and Baby Homes, you would see that after 1943, the death rate declined massively. And had Dr. James Deeney not intervened, we don't quite know what the outcome may have been. Mortality rates among children born to private patients increased steadily from 1939 and had peaked in 1943, when a rate of 80% was recorded among this, meaning 8 in every 10 infants born to private patients in 1943 died in infancy. The mortality rate among private infants reduced to 50% in 1944, 1 in every 2 infants born to private patients died that year. Some of the main causes of death included... Uh, non-specific causes, meaning that this is generally a congenital debility, they were delicate from birth, prematurity or weakness from birth, 169 died from malabsorption, 165 from marasmus, 3 from malnutrition and 1 wasting from birth, 167 died from some degree of respiratory infection, 153 died from gastroenteritis, 40 from tuberculosis, 38 from a hemorrhage, and the list goes on. James Jeanie was the recently appointed, at the time, Chief Medical Advisor to the Department of Health. And his role was to inspect children who were living in the home. And in January of 1945, Dr. Deeney, accompanied by another doctor, visited Besborough. Deeney reported that he had, quote, inspected the maternity hospital block of the home and found the institution to be well maintained and perfectly equipped and seemingly suitably staffed for its present maternity work. 
further inspection of the part of the special home devoted to the children under the care of the order to see the similar state of affairs. In fact, the whole place is fresh and spotlessly clean. Special inspection of rooms reserved for milk storage and formula preparation also showed cleanliness, etc. Owing to the appalling infant mortality, I stripped and examined almost all infants in the home and discovered certain facts. And reading on, Dr. Deeney's report only got worse, where it was clear to Dr. Deeney that when he had examined the infants that were in the home with some of the conditions that they were suffering from, Deeney said, quote, obviously the result of neglect to change napkins insufficiently. A remark made about the fact that infants had excoriated buttocks and were grossly inflamed. And speaking about other things such as infectious lesions and septic sores. And honestly, thing just goes on and on. But after Dame Jeannie's intervention, the death rate declined massively. But that was not the only kind of misgivings that Beswell would have in its operation. Out of the 923 children that died in Besborough's walls or connected to Besborough but died elsewhere, such as St. Finbar's Hospital in Cork City, we only know the burial places of 64 children. 859 of them are missing. One story I would recommend listening to is the story of Madeline, a mother who went into Besborough in 1960 and gave birth to a baby boy called William. If you follow me on social media, you probably will have heard this and it sounds similar to you. That's probably because this is Carmel Cantwell's brother. In the show notes, you will find a link to a YouTube clip of the Besborough commemoration where Madeline spoke at the commemoration. But Carmel and myself had done our own bit of digging. And in terms of the burials that we could find in the session that we had done, we had found 54 children. And most of them, except maybe one or two, were buried in poor ground and it's unmarked. Despite there being some clarity for children who, who died in Besra in the 1920s, will likely never be found because of the unmarked burial ground. To this day, we still do not know where the Besra burial ground is. There have been varying views across different survivor groups about where the actual burial ground is. There has been no investigation carried out to come to a conclusion about where the burial ground actually is on Besborough. In Besborough, there were 31 deaths of women who were admitted to Besborough itself. And we do not know the names of all of them, nor do we know the names of all the children who died. I had written on my blog about trying to obtain names through a freedom of information request, considering that when the final report was released in January of 2021, they would have had on file the names of the children that they had found who had died in Besbra or who were associated with Besbra and had died elsewhere. But it turns out that when Radical Gorman opted to seal the files created by the commission in 2020, unfortunately, any lists of names of children that they had found or that they had collated would have been locked away. At this moment in time, I will not be able to get a list until 2050 of any names of children who died in Besbra that I have missed, that I don't have currently. And to give you an idea, I will be 47 <laughs> when this happens, and it just makes me wonder why they felt the need to seal all the records that we won't get a complete glimpse or a complete picture of modern baby homes until 2050. It really hurt personally when I wasn't able to collate all the names of Besbra children and Besbra mothers for the Besbra commemoration in 2024 back in June as it was the 10th commemoration held. So it would have been a nice thing to have for the milestone, but unfortunately it wasn't to be. In episode 4, Project Infant, I had mentioned about Beth, a woman who was born in Besborough House in 1970. But up until this point, in terms of podcasts, episodes, I never disclosed who Beth ever was. But if you'd followed on my blog, you would have found out who she was. So if you'd only ever listened to my podcast and had not been following my blog up to this point, to give you an idea, Beth is my mother. And she would have been one of the main reasons that I would have started Project Infant. 
and why it was important to try and do it. But I am hoping that with time, and with the help of my volunteers for Project Infant, that, that before 2050 even happens, we will have all the best for children and the best for mothers' names. It's guaranteed that there will likely be a few curveballs thrown in the way, but that is the joy and the equal challenge of doing this kind of research. I try to keep my episodes relatively short and try and touch on a few topics or a few points and expand on them. You know, people tend to like shorter episodes or short episodes in general, which is what I try to aim with this. So in the show notes, I will try and add some resources such as news articles, books, and videos to consult with if you want to learn a bit more about Bezber itself. But I'll leave it at that for this episode. So I hope you enjoyed, and I hope to see you next time on the Irish Genealogy Podcast.